Good evening. I'm Dr. Heather Fowler. I'm a veterinarian and current PhD student with the University of Washington's Engage program. Here to welcome you to tonight's evening, or to, well, to the event tonight. I'm a One Health researcher, and One Health is a research approach that is based on the understanding that the health of people, animals, and the environment are all connected and thus must be studied simultaneously in order to address today's issues. I get the opportunity, um, or excuse me, I get to have this opportunity because of the special collaboration between Town Hall and UW's Engage program. Together, they host the series called UW Science Now as part of the excuse me, as part of the Seattle Science Lectures. Sponsors include Microsoft and KPLU. Each speaker's program will run about 25 minutes, including five minutes for questions. We ask that you come to the mics at the edge of the stage, so one there and one over there, so we can pick up your um, information for the recording. Before I introduce our first guest, I'd like to mention some other events from the science series. First of all, please join us tonight for Eric J. Dolan, or Dolan, I apologize if I butchered that last name, who will be discussing an illuminating history of lighthouses. And so we would invite you to stay the night and move up to the tables in the front if you do stay. And that takes place tonight at 7.30 following these engaged talks. Also, the next talk in the UW Science Now speaker series will be right here next Wednesday, May 18th, starting at 6 p.m. Chris Baldwin, who you'll meet later, will, cha will challenge a pillar of physics and talk about unmeltable materials. And now for our first guest. Large dams that gener generate hydropower are critical to human society. They prevent floods and ensure a supply of water for drinking and agriculture. However, these dams also alter the way rivers flow, which hampers downstream environments. William Chen will discuss this, com this conflict and how math and statistics can help society preserve freshwater fish communities while still maintaining the utility of dams. Please give a warm welcome to William Chen. Thanks, Heather, for the introduction. Hi, as she said, I am Will Chen, uh, and I am a quantitative biologist. And a lot of people ask me, well, what is that? And what it is, is essentially a field where we use mathematics and computer models and statistics to try and answer questions about the environment and the organisms that live within. And I hope I can show you how today. So my work, uh, as already been mentioned, is on dams. This is a picture of Orville Dam in California, and it turns out it is one of the largest dams in California. But it is just one of many. Uh, the color here isn't terribly important, but each dot represents a dam in the United States, of which there are nearly 80,000, and even more around the world. And for good reason, because they provide a number of services to society, including hydropower, flood control, water for irrigation, of course, drinking water. However, they also alter the way rivers move and rivers flow. For example, when you put in a hydropower dam, it can change the way that the water flows during the day to match the energy that we as a society need, such as more water during the day, but not so much flow during the night. And this is not exactly natural. It can also lower uh, the occurrence of these extreme floods, obviously, for flood control. And it can also lower water levels because we need to take the water out for our own drinking water and our irrigation. And so what ends up happening when you put in a dam, here's a graph that I'm going to show uh, pretty similar of throughout this talk, where on the x-axis you'll see time uh, over the course of a year, and on the y-axis is the amount of water that's moving through the river. So this can be the amount, it can be the, the speed of the water, um, which I'm just going to refer to for the rest of the talk as flow. And when you put in a dam, one of the things that happens is that throughout the year you get lower water levels uh, on average. And in addition, across different years, 
you'll see that the variation in these flows also changes drastically. And this is important because it turns out that flow is a major, if not the most important driver of the ecosystems downstream of the dam. They provide the connectivity of the river, how the different reaches and different uh, branches of the river are connected and how nutrients and vegetation are distributed. They provide the vegetation and the growth of plants along the river. And these flows also control the types of habitat and how much habitat there is for species and fish that are living within. So what ends up happening when you construct a dam is such. So imagine you have a river where you, know, you have some bank vegetation, you have some native fish, and when you put a dam in, a lot of things change. Because of the ways that they change how the river flows, you get a change in the vegetation and the plants that lie along the river. You get a change, possibly the loss of native species in the river. And these can be replaced by invasive fish that before could not really thrive in the conditions that was there, but now that you've changed the way this river flows, suddenly can do much better. And this is an issue because they threaten the existence of these native fish, which ultimately are responsible for keeping our waters clean, for responsible for keeping our water safe, and providing those services for society. So there's clearly some conflicts here between using water for our own use versus providing water for these rivers. And they're only going to get worse as time goes on. This is a map of the United States where you see darker, redder colors as more water stress, more deficits from the amount of water that is supplied versus the amount of water we need. And you can see along the West and the Southwest in particular that things are not looking better. You might have heard of the California drought situation. This is a picture of the Lake Orville that I actually showed you earlier. And you can see comparing between 2011 and 2014 how much different the water levels are. And it turns out actually uh, that I just found out that it's only a couple months ago that this, this reservoir, this dam has been able to release water again. And just to really show you how desperate some of these situations are, I'm a California native, and I went back home the, the other month, and I went to the, my, the backyard of my parents' home, and it was completely lined, completely lined with buckets to catch rainwater, because there was no other way that my parents were going to be able to water their plants or wash their dishes, because California has instigated a tax on water, because that's how little they have. So. Clearly, there's some conflicts here. Now, scientists have tried to alleviate these conflicts already. Uh, the main approach being, well, we, ha we have these services that we need, but we can maybe provide something for the, for the fish still. Well, if dams have these particular impacts on the downstream flows of rivers, what if we were to try and reverse those impacts? You know, for a hydropower dam, what if we were to try um, not varying the daily flow so much? For a flood control dam, perhaps we'll release a little bit more water downstream. And that's all fine and good, except, as I just mentioned, we're having a lot less water. Drought has become a lot more common. So those techniques aren't as reliable as they once were. For even if we try and mimic these old historical natural undammed conditions, we don't have the water to truly do that anymore. And what results is that, well, sure, we can try and mimic flows such that the native fish are happy. But because we can't do it perfectly, they're no longer going to deter the non-natives, the invasives that are already there. And like I said before, that means more threats for the natives. Well, darn. What now? Well, my research tries to tackle this problem in a different way. Rather than trying this essentially infeasible objective of trying to mimic these historical conditions, what if we were to take what we know about what, the what flows fish prefer 
and design flows from the ground up? What if we had the power to be able to say, fish prefer flows like this, let's mimic, excuse me, let's design flows with the water that we have to best accommodate their needs. The question is, how do we do that? Rivers are a very dynamic system. And the flows change from day to day, which means there's a lot of decisions. Essentially, an, an incountable, uncountable number of decisions. So if we want to be good environmental stewards, how do we go about coming to the right decisions that balance society's need for water while also accommodating for these fish? And the answer that I pose to you is mathematical optimization. Now, this is uh, a field uh, that has been used in industry a lot for managing supply lines, figuring out shipping routes, all sorts. And you may not have heard of the term mathematical optimization before, but it turns out it applies to your daily lives as well. For example, when you're shopping for groceries. Now, mathematical optimization is all about efficiency, about dealing with the constraints that you have and meeting a particular goal within those constraints. In the case of groceries, you might have a family that have particular dietary needs. For example, someone might like be allergic to nuts, but really likes kale. Someone might really hate cilantro, such as I, but really like roast chicken. And you might have someone that won't eat anything that isn't covered in cheese. <laughs> and your job is to go shopping for groceries for dinner while trying to minimize the amount of money you spend, perhaps minimizing the amount of time you spend cooking and ideally maximizing the tastiness of your meal. Now where mathematical optimization comes in is, is this exact thing, but taken up a notch. Instead of planning dinner for a day, think about planning dinner for a whole year in one grocery trip. trip. That is the power of mathematical optimization. Now, let's come back to our problem at hand. For dams, we can put it in the same kind of light. If you have certain constraints on the dam and the reservoir, for example, you only have so much water. The dam can only release so much water at a given time, and the reservoir can only hold so much water at any given time. In addition, we want to be able to provide water for society. So we need to make sure that there's water for irrigation, there's water for drinking, and that it matches the demands throughout the year. Such as for irrigation, a lot of water is demanded during the summer yet not so much during the winter. And our goals are to provide for these native fish, to promote these populations, while also deterring the invasives that are in the river at the same time. Cool. So how does this work in practice? My study system is the San Juan River in New Mexico. Uh, you can see a little picture of it in the bottom right. And this is a, a river that is home to, oops, excuse me. This is a river that is fed by snow melt from the mountains, so it is characteristic that there is a lot of flow during the spring. Um, and it also has a monsoon season. So around August, there's a lot of flows there. However, in the 1960s, uh, we, we built a dam on this river. It's the Navajo Reservoir and the Navajo Dam. And this is a picture of that there. Just for reference, here's the dam itself. So you can see the size of the dam, the size of the reservoir in comparison. And they use this water for meeting all the agricultural and irrigation needs of the area. In addition, this river also contains a number of fish species, including a number of natives and a number of invasives. So we want to be able to figure out what flows these fish prefer. And I had the great opportunity, even though I'm a quantitative biologist, I'd sit in front of the computer most of the time, I had the opportunity to go out and see how my data is collected. So, oh, and it turns out, it's amazing. We float down the river for hundreds of miles looking for fish and trying to catch them with these giant nets. And we're able, 
Over the course of a number of years, the data that I use incorporates 20 years, and we can track the dif different species and how many and how abundant they are from year to year. And by giving us a sense of how many fish there are, we can then say, okay, let's look at how the river flows during each one of these years. So this is the uh, axis that you've seen before. On the x-axis again is the time in a given year, and on the y-axis is the amount of flow on any given day. And we can compare that to our fish samples. We can say, ah, on a year that looks like this, with the flows that look like that, this is how many fish of a particular species that we get. And we can see how that changes with the river flows. For example, you might see a year that flows like that with a uh, corresponding response. And this is all real data, by the way. So we can see that you know, perhaps the species in purple might respond better to higher flows during the summer. And what this allows us to do is then figure out on any given day, what is the contribution of higher flows to these fish populations. On the x-axis again is the time in a given year. On the y-axis now is the benefit of greater flows. So going up from the zero means that flow is benefiting. More flow is benefiting the particular species and on going down is that they're detrimental. And what do we see? Well, we found that we get somewhat expected results. Surprisingly, we're able to see how these native fish benefit from flows on any given day. For example, the benefits to these natives during the spawning their spawning season in the spring. At the same time, we can do the same for the invasives, and we see that that lines up just as well. Where we see, again, in a timing synchrony with their spawning season. But moreover, we can see some other interesting patterns when you lie the two on top of each other. For example, this monsoon. Remember, as I said earlier, that the monsoons hit during this river around the summertime. And it turns out that they flush out a lot of these fish in the rivers. But there's some other interesting things that maybe wasn't as expected for us, such as, well, this sort of seasonal overlap between the natives and the invasive fish. And also, some windows of opportunity. And this is the power of being able to design flows. You can look at where they overlap and where they don't and try and design flows that take advantage of that. So for example, I'm gonna show you two results, one of which is when there's a lot of water available and one when there isn't. And the first one, uh, again, the similar axis where you have time on the x-axis and flows on the y. If we were to try to hypothetically mimic the historical conditions, try and go back to what flows were like before the dam was there, it might look like something like this, where we see, again, the spring floods and the summer monsoons. Well, if we try to design flows, on the other hand, oops, we see something that looks like this. Remember when I said where there was those windows of opportunity and where those overlaps were? We see those in our designs. There's early flood initiation relative to what would be natural. There's a similar spring flood. And there's a number of different differences in the summer flows. And these sort of differences between the designs and the naturally occurring flows change drastically when you go into the dry season. So for dry years, again, a similar graph, the natural flows might look something like this. They're, very, they're relatively similar to what you saw in the previous slide, but the design is quite different. There's almost no overlap between these two, uh, excuse me, these two diagrams. You see an earlier flood, but you don't see that similarity in the spring floods that you saw before. And in, interestingly, you also see the contrast in the timing of the summer floods. So clearly, there's a lot of differences here. And yet, and yet, I want to show you how much better we can do. This is a graph of 
the uh, increases that we would expect in the populations of the native and invasive fish. So ideally, we would want to have a lot of natives and not a lot of invasives. So you want to be in this blue cross quadrant in the lower right. You really don't want to be in the red quadrant where you don't get your natives and you get a lot of invasives. And the purple represents sort of the intermediate between the two. Now, if you were to try to account for all of society's water demands while mimicking natural flows, you get a solution that's sort of where the, where the star is. Sure, you can hit the invasive populations, you can hamper them, but you don't get a lot of benefit to the native populations. On the other hand, we found that there's multiple different designs that can do better than mimicking natural flows. Each one of these points represents a different design that I'm showing you here today. And I'd like to point out a point such as this, where we have both more benefit to natives and more detriment to the invasive fish populations. But that's not all. We, because we have all these different designs, we have a ton of flexibility in trying to meet these ecological, these environmental goals. For example, if you wanted to hit the invasives even harder, you can pick a point like that. If you wanted to promote even more natives, you can select a design such as that one. So I hope I have illustrated to you today that there's incredible opportunity for both meeting our societal water needs while also helping the environment. And I find that astounding. And I hope so, I hope you guys too. Because in, in ecology and environment, there's so many stories about doom and gloom, about how you know, society and the environment are at odds, how we're gonna have to you know, either deforest or ruin the environment. But it doesn't have to be that way. We have the ability, we have the data to be able to both help ourselves and help the environment. And I hope that I've shown you how mathematics can help us get us there. And with that, I would like to thank Town Hall and the Engage Seminar for giving me the opportunity to speak to you guys today, as well as my funding sources and the departments and my lab for all of their support. And I'd be happy to take any of your questions. Have any of your design plans, or is there a plan put in your design plan into practice and try them out, especially if it's kind of this do no harm idea? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and that's exactly the, the goal of this project, is to be able to put this into action. And I've been in conversation with my collaborators on the river, and they seem to be incredibly receptive. Now, um, they, th I, I will say that management on the river that I work with, the St. Helen River, they've already been doing a little bit of the management. They've already been trying these ideas of trying to um, release particular floods and release, you know, hold back particular amounts of water to be able to um, promote natives. And we're just starting actually these conversations because honestly the, the tools to be able to do this are just emerging and it's incredibly exciting. Um, so you touched on a lot of really obvious benefits for this. What are the barriers or pushback to implementing something like that? That is also a great question, <laughs> one I think about a lot. Um, so I think one of the uh, biggest, I would say, caveats uh, is that, well, for, for one, it is still nascent. Uh, this is one of the first um, forays into this kind of approach. and. I present, you know, one, of the, one of the challenges is that it does require a good deal of data. Uh, I mentioned that it takes about, I had about 20 years worth of data, and this is 20 years where they had to collect fish data uh, consistently from year to year, as well as have the forethought to have uh, the, the gauges to be able to measure how, flow, how river fl rivers flow from year to year. Uh, so I will say that as a challenge. However, I think, people are meeting this challenge. I think there's already a lot of interest and a lot of infrastructure already in place. Uh, the question is, do we have the models to be able to get us the rest of the way? 
That was sort of going to be my question. Um, <laughs> Great, two for one. Uh, the other one is that um, you could probably do better, like if you knew what the precipitation or whatever was going to be for the whole year, or mm -hmm. you know, looking back in hindsight. But there must be a certain amount of uh, you have to build in. Um, uh, not knowing exactly what's going to happen for the rest of the year or something like that. Of course. That, right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, um, and it's funny you bring that up because I think that's actually where we're going next. Um, now that we have these models, the very, the very interesting next step is, well, what do you do with it? You know, uh, one of the major challenges in talking with these collaborators, and getting back to that question, is that they operate, uh, they have to operate, they have to forecast, right? Um, and there are ways to get to get to that. Um, I talked about mathematical optimization, and I use historical data. There's actually a um, subfield of mathematical optimization that gets at that exact question: of what do you do when you don't know what's coming up? And there are there are ways. There's mathematical tools to get around that. So uh, my question is relating to these fish. It seems like they're sort of your primary indicator for whether or not your flows are optimized correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned though, that vegetation and other organisms are at stake here. And so kind of a two-part question. The first is, did you look at other indicators and have you seen changes uh, to the benefit of native species uh, in those other indicators? Um, and then the other question is related to a graph that you showed earlier where we saw a population of fish that was dramatically high in 1993 and then steadily decreasing over the last 20 years or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, and my question is whether or not we're even going to be able to make a dent in that overall decrease and whether that's sort of a bigger problem than just flow optimization. Ooh, yeah. Um. So I'll take the second one first, and then you might have to remind me of the first one. Uh, <laughs> um, so yeah, that's totally right. That you know, it's it's a complex issue, right? Because there's a number of species in the river, um, and some of these actually some of these species respond very well uh, to to flows, particularly the natives. So these natives, uh, it, they've evolved to be able to adapt to these particular flows, and when you try and um, design flows around that, they respond really well. Having said that, there are other species, particularly the invasives, that sometimes are not so responsive. Uh, and so that's actually uh, something that I thought about is like, well, how do we incorporate these uh, flow designs with other management options, such as like physically, mechanically moving these non natives? And that has been done, that's starting to be done now that we have more, uh, more information about both. Uh, and then the first question was whether you actually will measure uh, sort of yes. changes in other species. Yeah. Um, so I personally didn't. Uh, I didn't. Unfortunately, again, like I said before, that it requires a lot of data, and I unfortunately don't have that data. However, I do know that um, people are starting to do similar experiments. Uh, not necessarily um, designing and put them in this framework that I did, but they're starting. To, they have already done experiments about, for example. Um, the bank vegetation, they've done experiments to see which floods are good for particular species. Uh, I know one, the, uh, I, f I forget which river it is, but uh, they've, I know some researchers have done research on the tamarisk, the invasive tamarisk, that like salt cedar, that has been really decimating some of the native plants. And they found that uh, releasing particular floods can have a one-two punch of like promoting the native as well also. Um, hindering the, the invasive salt cedar. So yeah, it's out there. Thank you. Thank you.